Welcome, everyone, wherever you are in Europe and in the world. Um, we are delighted to have you uh, join us on this webinar today. My name is Esther Mary Darcy. I am the chair of the Europe region of World Physiotherapy. And this is our World Physiotherapy Day celebration uh, webinar, even though it's coming to a few days earlier than the 8th of September, which marks the day on which our global organization of professional organizations was founded back in 1951. Uh, the theme of this year's World Physiotherapy Day is low back pain and the Europe region is delighted to join with the European Pain Federation in hosting this webinar on, on the role of physiotherapy in low back pain. Um, while the global burden of disease study showed that low back pain is the leading cause of years lived with disability, the positive news is that low back pain responds to physiotherapy and going on to an emphasis on self-management. Um, two recently uh, research studies in both in The Lancet demonstrate the value of physiotherapy, one involving a comprehensive mind-body physiotherapy approach in terms of reducing both pain and cost. And the second one, brings to mind an old Latin phrase, which I really like, um, which is uh, solvitur ambulando, um, which means it is solved by walking or, or moving. And now there is scientific evidence to show that. This second study showed that a combined health coaching physiotherapy with a progressive walking program actually significantly reduced the risk of recurrence. Um, so today, we want to share the role and the evidence um, with you. And, and we're very fortunate to be joined by a panel of physiotherapist experts in uh, low back pain, um, including members of our musculoskeletal disorders advisory group in the Europe region. Uh, Gay Pierce Murphy will, will chair the session um, and Professor Kieran O'Sullivan from Ireland and Professor Felix Khan from Turkey will talk about, uh, about the myths and the evidence. And we're equally delighted to be joined by our colleague, Professor Brona Fullen um, from the European Pain Federation and its immediate uh, past president, who will speak about the resources that EFIC, um, the European Pain Federation, has produced for the evidence-based management of low back pain. Um, Professor Fulham will also speak uh, to you about the, the Federation. And uh, Miguel Perez, a physiotherapist from the Europe Region Secretariat, will speak to you a little bit about the Europe uh, region of world physiotherapy. So I hope that you will find this webinar um, of benefit. And thank you again for joining us. And I will now hand you over uh, to the chair, uh, Gay Pip Murphy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Esther Mary. And I'd like to introduce Miguel Perez Navarro, who is a physiotherapist graduated from the University of Valencia and works for the European region of World Physiotherapy as the Communications and Operations Officer. Among his tasks are the coordination of the European region working groups, attending and participating in events and conferences on behalf of the association and internal and external communications. Miguel. Hello everybody, my name is Miguel Perez Navarro. I'm a physiotherapist working as communication and operations officer for the Europe region of World Physiotherapy. And I'm going to make a brief introduction of what is the Euro region and its musculoskeletal disorders satellite working group. Founded in 1951, World Physiotherapy operates as a non-profit organization. It represents more than 600,000 uh, physiotherapists worldwide through its 128 member organizations. World Physiotherapy has five regions. It's composed of member organizations in that geographical area. Uh, the South America region, the Africa region, North America Caribbean region, Asia Western Pacific region, and the Euro region. 
The Euro Region is a non-profit, non-governmental organization that represents the physiotherapy profession at European level. Founded in 1998, it has a membership of 58 physiotherapy associations, one from each of the European countries, representing approximately uh, 200,000 physiotherapists in Europe. This makes the Euro Region the largest region, region of world physiotherapy. The strategic objectives of the Euro Region are demonstrate the value and impact of physiotherapy, the recognition of physiotherapists by the national authority as autonomous professionals in the nation, in national uh, uh, healthcare system, promote excellence in physiotherapy education, practice and research, and to be influential in relevant policy development at EU and national level. To summarize briefly how the working groups of the Euro region works, uh, every two years, the general meeting of the region is held. Uh, representatives of its member organizations need to uh, meet to approve budgets, documents produced or updated during the last two years, discuss current issues in European physiotherapy, and vote for half of the members of the executive committee. After the general meeting, the executive committee meets to select the physiotherapist who will be part of the working groups for the next two years from the nomination sent by the member organizations. Currently, the region has three permanent working groups, the advocacy and EU, education and research and professional practice, two thematic working groups, mental health and cancer, and one satellite working group on uh, musculoskeletal disorders. These working groups uh, will, over the next two years, be responsible for developing uh, position statements, information papers, communication materials, carry out surveys and produce reports on the situation of physiotherapy on certain topics, uh, these are used for uh, by the Euro region and member organizations to advocate for the profession. The members of the working groups represent the Euro region attending and participating in events and conferences as delegated by the executive committee of the region. They arrange webinars to different target groups that are afterwards uploaded to the YouTube channel, collaborate with EU institutions, and collaborate with uh, stakeholders and other healthcare associations. Since the creation of the MSD Satellite Working Group in 2020, its members have collaborated with the uh, with EU OSA, the European Agency for Safety and Health at Work, by participating in the last two editions of its Healthy Workplaces campaign. They also collaborate with the European Pain Federation, EFIC, by contributing their knowledge and experience, experience in their On The Move campaign and in other possible projects such as this joint webinar. In addition, the MSD's satellite working group, influenced by, uh, by the EU OSA campaign, has developed over the last two years several initiatives focusing on MSD's at work, a position paper on the role of Physiotherapy in MSDs in the age of remote work, a booklet with an illustrated version on the management of MSDs at work, and is running a social media campaign called Move at Work, where every Monday a tip is posted to encourage uh, more movement in the workplace and reduce MSDs at work in workplaces. Also, uh, influenced by the USA campaign, uh, the MSD Satellite Working Group held a joint webinar on cost-effective options to tackle MSDs in the telework era. Um, you have access to all this information and materials of the MSD Satellite Working Group on the Euro Regions website, which uh, you can access via this QR code. And well, this was all from me. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, you have my email address here in case you want to contact me and the social uh, networks of the Euro region so you can follow them if you want to be up updated on what we do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Miguel.
Now, I'd like to introduce Professor Brona Fullen. So Brona is the past president of the Irish Pain Society. And also from 2020 to 2023, she held the position of president of the European Pain Federation, EFIC. She is the first chartered physiotherapist and the first female to be elected to this position in the organization's history. But currently, her research focuses on pain management programs where she is leveraging 2D and 3D virtual reality technology to help people manage their pain. She is also integrating virtual reality technology into her students' physiotherapy programs to augment the students' clinical reasoning skills around pain. Today, Bruna is going to give us, first of all, an introduction, an introduction about ethic. Thank you, Gay. Um, welcome, everybody. On behalf of the European Pain Federation, I'm absolutely delighted to be collaborating with Europe Region of World Physiotherapy uh, to celebrate uh, our professional organisations. Uh, so as Gay mentioned, um, in my next presentation, I'll be discussing EFIC in detail. Uh, but just to give you an overview of who we are as an organisation, we are a multidisciplinary professional organisation in the field of pain research and pain medicine. And we represent the 38 European chapters of the International Association for the Study of Pain. So this current currently we would have more than 20,000 researchers in basic translational and clinical science, as well as doctors, physiotherapists, nurses and psychologists uh, who work managing people living with persistent pain, but of course are managing people with acute pain and hopefully preventing the development of uh, chronic pain. As an organization, I suppose our global aims are to advance research, education and the clinical management of pain, serving as the authoritative science-based resource on issues related to pain and its treatment in Europe. And you'll hear more about this uh, later. And over the three year terms of my presidency, and in fact, since I joined uh, the board of the European Pain Federation, I was very keen to reach out uh, to other European level organizations, you know, to collaborate and work together, because certainly pain, as we all know, is one of the, the core reasons people attend uh, for physiotherapy. So, you know, it was a very easy uh, link to make with Europe region of world physiotherapy. And I'd just like to publicly thank uh, Esther Mary Darcy and um, the Europe region of world physiotherapy, you know, for working so well with us uh, at uh, EPIC and building strong links, which I know are, are continuing to develop and will into uh, the future. Uh, so for the moment, thank you very much from me. Thanks very much, Bruna. So now we have our first speaker this morning, who is Professor Kieran O'Sullivan. Kieran is the head of physiotherapy at the University of Limerick in Ireland. His primary area of research is low back pain. And today, Kieran is going to talk about the myths of low back pain. Thank you very much, Guy. And um, thanks to um, World, uh, Europe Region of World Physio for involving me in this campaign. So um, Feliz and I, over the next 15 minutes or so, <clears throat> are going to talk about some of the myths of low back pain. Um, first of all, before I, I suppose, Feliz and I speak, I'd like to acknowledge that this is not the work of just myself or anybody else. I was one of the people involved from World Physiotherapy in the development of this campaign, and I'd like to acknowledge the work of others. And what we came up with, uh, in summary, looking at the evidence, and I guess some parallel campaigns that have been done before, was a series of 12 myths that we feel the evidence suggests are not particularly evidence-based or useful. So in other words, there might be myths out there that are inaccurate, but might be relatively harmless. However, in these 12, there is at least a suggestion that some of these myths are unhelpful and are things that we could target with a view to changing um, knowledge, but especially beliefs, attitudes, and practices amongst people with persistent back pain, as well as family members, members of the community, and so on. So if I go through those campaigns, and we'll talk about them you know, in a little bit of detail in the questions and answers, if people have um, a desire for that, 
A lot of them are around the structural model of pain, which is what many of us would have been, I suppose, trained in many years ago. So the first one was that my back hurts a lot, so I must have seriously damaged it. And while, of course, specific injuries and pathologies can be a part of some pain, and especially the onset of pain, what we know at this stage is that people can have tremendous back pain, but have thankfully relatively little evidence of serious damage. They might have some normal age-related changes, but the chance of somebody with back pain having serious damage in their spine is relatively low, and a qualified physiotherapist or other healthcare professional is usually in a good position to tell you if there's significant damage or not. Because of that, it's rare that scans or x-rays are needed in order to kind of determine what best practice management should look like. So again, in contrast, years ago, we might have thought that a good treatment for back pain depends on a particular type of x-ray or scan so we could get a good picture of the spine, but that doesn't look like it's the case anymore. And again, on that same theme of the structural nature of back pain, there was a concern that people will wear out their back and they will inevitably end up with back pain if they do demanding tasks such as bending and lifting. Whereas again, in the short term, for sure, people, including myself, can get you know, sore and stiff from doing unaccustomed bending and lifting. There's no evidence that that's dangerous in the long term. Quite understandably, painkillers have um, had a place in the management of back pain, or at least pain medications. Um, and unfortunately, that has included testing some medications with significant side effects. And so we're increasingly aware of the risks of opioids and other medications being trialed with significant side effects. And at least if these were having a big effect on pain, we might justify them. But what the evidence tells us is these strong pain medications have a modest effect on pain, yet significant downsides. From a manual therapy point of view, it's probably pretty common that people who have seen a physiotherapist or a chiropractor and had some manipulation performed, it's quite common that they associate the reduction of pain in the short term with something being put back into place. Whereas what we know at this stage is that even if you have an adjustment or a manipulation done to your back and you feel better, that's great in the short term, but it's probably about other things rather than something being realigned. Um, as a middle-aged man like myself, I'm very conscious of, you know, things can start to creak and, and all that as we get to, to being a little bit older. But actually getting older in itself does not inevitably mean we're going to have back pain. In fact, if you look at the biggest times of increases in back pain, there's specific periods like adolescence where we go from very little back pain to lots. But the it's not inevitable as we get older. Going back to, I guess, a more positive message, one of the things that the public seem to have understood is this, this next myth. Previously, there would have been a big um, belief amongst the public that staying in bed and resting was really important uh, before you return to work or engage with rehabilitation. Whereas thankfully, the message of movement being important is thankfully getting out there. And I guess that's, it's a bit like for me, that emphasis of switching from rest to movement is a little bit like the, what we've seen with GPs prescribing antibiotics for sore throats which aren't evidence-based, and it takes a while for those messages to get out there, but they can. Moving on, obviously we're advocates of exercise, but it is of course possible and common that when people with back pain start to exercise that it might be painful. And while we are not suggesting that people must suffer through their rehabilitation or we must inflict terrible pain, it is quite possible that some of the exercises we prescribe might be uncomfortable and painful at the start. And obviously we'd like that to be as comfortable and um, acceptable to people as possible, but that pain is not reflective of harm. It probably reflects the fact that your body hasn't moved in a long time. It's quite sensitive to movement. And so again, helping people understand that in the context of persistent back pain, things can hurt and that's not necessarily dangerous or harmful. Going on to the last few, I did my PhD on sitting posture and back pain. And as soon as I told people that, they almost instinctively felt that they had to sit up straight like a good boy or girl because it's a cultural a kind of belief out there that um, sitting posture is causative. If you sit particularly slouched, you are going to get back pain. Whereas what the evidence tells us is people who sit slouched, yes, lots of them get back pain, but people who sit upright also get back pain. People who sit over to one side get back pain because back pain is a common human experience. There is no one bad posture causing back pain and there are other more important things we can focus on. Then final, uh, the, the final few, and Feliz is going to talk about different forms of exercises in a while. 
there's been a lot of focus, especially I suppose going back for the last 20 or 30 years on one particular form of exercise being important. And that was these exercises called core exercises. So specifically focused on the back and the tummy. And I guess to acknowledge, first of all, the, those exercises, like any exercise, can help people with back pain. But there's, not, there's nothing specifically more effective about them. So from our point of view, the good news is that all exercises seem to have a beneficial effect on back pain, but we should probably be more focused on preference, cost, and access. So do they like it? Can they afford it? Is it available close to their home? As opposed to there being one best exercise. Because then of the evidence that physiotherapy using these approaches can have a health, uh, beneficial effect on back pain, we're now happy that there is I, I suppose, a great potential for us to help people with back pain. Um, and that's a good alternative because the evidence that surgery or injections can help back pain is modest at best. And we have, again, some greater risks with some of those interventions. So it's rare. Surgery injections will still have a role, but it's rare that they are necessary to, to solve back pain in particular. And I guess, finally, on that idea that when your pain is bad, it must be damaged. Again, if people go from having mild pain to moderate pain to severe pain, it isn't that their spine is getting much more damaged. It's a mix of all these factors across lifestyle, psychological factors, and so on. So as I said, when we, we're going to talk about um, those two approaches. I'm going to focus just very briefly on how we might look at the education self-management, which would align with those myths. And then Felice is going to talk about some clinical interventions. So in terms of education and self-management, I think we have a role in challenging those structural myths. So explaining, as I've touched on, why scans and x-rays might be useful sometimes, but that's pretty rare. Why medication injections and surgery, they, their effectiveness is modest. There are some risks. We should really delay engaging in some of those interventions until they're really necessary. Because again, in terms of the concept of back pain, it is not primarily a structural problem. It is a biopsychosocial problem. We are treating humans, not scans. On the frailty myths, lots of those ones that we looked at are based on the idea that the spine, the lumbar spine is particularly frail, that if you sit a certain way or bend a certain way or too much, things can go out of place and wear and become very brittle. Even the concept of aging is around a crumbling or a degenerative kind of a process happening in the back, and that because of pain, we must rest. And again, while these beliefs are common and understandable to some extent based on what we used to believe, over time, I feel we really have to challenge that message that the body and the spine is that frail. And again, not by forcing people, but by gradually, gradually building resilience, so building up confidence. And we can't just talk people into being more confident. In other words, if somebody's afraid of bending, we can't just tell them, just bend, you'll be fine. We have to practice with them, grade that exposure to bending, build up their physical conditioning, but also their psychological readiness for that. So building resilience rather than fear. And then finally, I suppose, and that's, this is where we come to this scope of practice considerations around where are we going and what can physios do within these other factors. I think physios can have a very good role in facilitating holistic self-management support for these other factors that are really important to me. That can be sleep, stress, worries, activity, diet. But critically, and again, we can come back to that in the questions, we don't want that to come from a preachy kind of um, blaming the patient for their predicament perspective. We want to try and support them and find solutions that will work for them. And so moving forward, what kind of things can we do? So in the short term facilitators of addressing this myths, the good thing is we have the evidence, evidence that some of our interventions are effective, some other interventions are ineffective and have costs and harm. So the evidence is facilitating that, but evidence alone will not be enough. I think campaigns like uh, this current one are important, and as well as some of the stuff that Brona will talk about in terms of educational materials are important. We need to reach out to people to change these myths in different settings and formats and have different messengers. So not just the clinicians, but the patients, and again, linking in with patient advocacy groups and employers and so on. But there are some challenges. Societally, there is a dominant biomedical outlook, and that means wider society, but also patients, employers, healthcare professionals. It reflects the way we've all been brought up to um, think about pain, and that won't change overnight. We probably need to keep looking at how professions are training, including physio, but actually a whole series of different professions. And part of the challenge there will be making sure that each profession is comfortable with their professional identity. 
So, for example, when people come to see me as a physio with back pain, they're still almost automatically getting ready to take off their clothes because they're already thinking of the traditional stuff we do, which we will still do around examination of the spine. But they're probably not as ready for a detailed discussion around sleep and stress and work-life balance and so on. And so each profession, and I think physio is very well positioned for this, needs to think about where our scope of practice for back pain lies. We will still have a big emphasis on history taking, clinical examination, hands-on palpation, identification of barriers to recovery, but it might over time continue to evolve. And I guess beyond the profession, there's real challenges in funding models. I think, for example, if I go back to the top, the evidence is there for us having a really strong role, but funding models don't support that for either prevention or treatment. So for example, for prevention of back pain in my own organization and many, the focus is on the height of my disc, the position of my laptop, but not about other factors that have a greater evidence base. And in terms of treatment, it is probably still the case that in most countries, it is easier to get funding for an injection or an arthroscopy or some other interventions that have less of an evidence base than supported supervised rehabilitation, such as um, a physiotherapist can provide. There are some links, uh, I suppose, providing resources for this campaign and related to that. And that's all I've got. Thank you very much. Uh, and now I'd like to move on to Professor Phyllis Khan. And Phyllis is from the Haktapi University in Ankara in Turkey. She is a lecturer there in the Faculty of Musculoskeletal and Orthopedic Physical Therapy and Rehabilitation. She's also a member of the Executive Committee of the Turkish Association, where she holds the, the International Affairs Chair. Felix is also a member of the Education and Research Matters Group of this organization. Her personal research is in the area of orthopedic rehabilitation, rehabilitation of the, of the elderly, sports injuries, and manipulation therapy. So today, Felix is going to continue on the, the discussion about physiotherapy in low back pain. Thank you, Phyllis. Thank you, Lee. First of all, I would like to uh, congratulate the World Physiotherapy Day or my colleagues all over the world. And also I would like to give my thankfulness to World Physiotherapy Europe region to inc include me this uh, webinar. Okay, Sharon has given such a valuable, uh, 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 important, key uh, uh, points about education and self-management, and then what we could do in the clinics as a physiotherapist. Actually, the aim of physiotherapy in patients with low back pain uh, to relieve pain or promote analgesia, to create controlled forces to the articulations or also the soft tissues, to promote non-destructive movements, and to increase neuromuscular efficiency because the, these patients has got some deficits uh, in their proprioception or uh, neuromuscular uh, responses, and also to provide biomechanical counseling. So uh, regarding to uh, some guidelines about management of low back pain, we can uh, see various uh, type of interventions uh, in physiotherapy like exercise therapy, manual therapy, specific exercises, motor control training, education, back school programs, behavioral treatment, uh, electrotherapy, uh, water therapy, uh, traction, and also multimodal treatment. But uh, the results uh, came from the some meta-analysis and also the, uh, uh, also the uh, systematic reviews uh, especially focused uh, uh, exercises, we have to uh, focus on uh, especially stabilization and motor control exercises, plates, resistance training, and aerobic exercises. So uh, especially these kind of exercises has been found most effective treatment options. Then, sorry, uh, therapeutic exercises in uh, uh, low back pain uh, covered many well-known exercise strategies, especially for rehabilitating the functional demands and activity, enhancing cardiovascular fitness, improving uh, flexibility, and then the also biomechanical efficiency, 
assisting pain relief uh, through several local or general physiological effects. Uh, when we are planning as an exercise program, as a physio, we have to mostly focus on lumbar multifidus and transversus abdominis because all those muscles are the key muscles of the uh, rehabilitation uh, of the back. Uh, actually, especially in the uh, specific exercise uh, program, uh, core exercising or also the stabilization exercising, we are using these exercises. But uh, in addition to exercising trunk muscles, we have to take into consideration of the uh, movement of the upper extremity because uh, the movement of the upper extremity activates the, the transversus abdominis uh, muscle contraction. That's why uh, we have to think about also uh, these uh, helpful uh, strategies. Core stability exercises, uh, you'll, uh, you know very well these exercises of the physiotherapist because uh, most national and international guidelines recommend these exercises. And then uh, uh, core stability exercises has strong evidence in pain and disability. Uh, and then those exercises uh, has uh, is most one of beneficial exercises, especially for segmental stability. Uh, the current literature also mentioning about the stabilization exercise tends to improve balance, especially the patients suffering from low back pain, uh, uh, elderly patients suffering from low back pain. So you can see some uh, 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 exercises, uh, core stability exercises in my clinic. Uh, then what about uh, what about the other exercises? Actually, Pilates is one of the uh, uh, effective exercises uh, because the study results uh, state that uh, Pilates exercises uh, has uh, significant uh, 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 tends to uh, significant improvements in pain relief and functional enhancement in the short term, but not more effective than the other exercises, especially in intermediate term. Uh, that's why we can use Pilates for pain and function, especially in the short term, but other exercises are more effective uh, in intermediate term. That's why dependent upon the uh, term, you can use uh, uh, or you can plan your exercise program. Uh, regarding the guidelines, uh, the water-based therapy or aqua therapy also very valuable uh, because uh, uh, aqua therapy or water-based exercises effective in decreasing pain uh, improved disability, improved quality of life, improved uh, lumbar range of motion. Uh, and then uh, it's recommended uh, these kind of exercises uh, more than land-based exercises because land-based land exercises uh, may give more loading and more forces for the vertebral column and also the soft tissue. That's why, especially uh, in the uh, initial term or first term of the exercise program, you can prefer these kind of uh, exercises in your program. Uh, all, uh, we can also use uh, endurance exercises, resistance training, progressive walking, uh, cycling, and also debated treadmill ambulation. But when we are using uh, treadmill, uh, we have to think about that in every uh, uh, steps especially in the heel strike of the uh, uh, gait, you, uh, you may have, the patient may have uh, anti-gravitational stress coming from the ground, especially uh, uh, the ground is very, uh, uh, not soft ground. So that's why the weighted treadmill ambulation can be preferable. What about the running or jogging? Because sometimes uh, 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 the patients uh, think about that running or jogging program also will be helpful for their rehabilitation. But running has been found to create increased compressive loads uh, on the joints of the lumbar spine. So uh, that's why, uh, especially if, if, if first term and then intermediate term, uh, the physios uh, should not recommend uh, the running program for their patients. 
the some study uh, results uh, state that there is a link between dysfunction in the local muscle and then the back pain, and then the, these patients uh, has proper have proprioceptive devices. Uh, these uh, uh, results came from the uh, uh, studies. Uh, it raised up the importance of the proprioceptive training for uh, uh, those patients. Uh, we wanted to uh, determine the effects of proprioceptive exercises on uh, posterior pelvic tilt strength and proprioception uh, in uh, chronic low back pain patients in our uh, clinics. And then we saw that both stabilization exercises uh, were, uh, uh, were effective, but uh, additional proprioception exercises uh, has given uh, beneficial effects, especially for proprioception of those patients. So that's why we also uh, giving a motor control or motor learning program for our patients because a motor learning uh, program uh, restore the coordination, uh, postural control or trunk control, uh, movement control, uh, capacity of the trunk muscle. Uh, and by this opportunity, the person controls their movement, posture, and also the muscle activation. Uh, if we don't consider the uh, neuroplasticity of the nervous system in patients, as, uh, particularly in uh, chronic low back patients, uh, we would not be so uh, uh, so uh, successful in our treatment program. That's why motor learning program is very important. Uh, in the motor learning program, we can use, we, we are using appropriate facilitation strategy with uh, giving uh, uh, extra proprioceptive input, uh, giving uh, awareness uh, in cognition, uh, facilitation of the muscle core activation, automatic reflex recruitment, and also giving some tactile and visual feedback. Then we will be successful uh, to control all body uh, and trunk muscles and also the coordinated uh, movement uh, in central nervous system and also the subcortical uh, uh, system. That's why a uh, motor learning model uh, currently is uh, com uh, compromising and also uh, 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 preferable uh, intervention in our program. What about the manual therapy? Actually, as a physio, we are uh, we are using manual therapy many times, but uh, sometimes we don't know it's it has uh, uh, evidence uh, uh, scientifically. So. Uh, some uh, systematic reviews and meta-analyses concluded that manipulation and mobilization uh, have moderate quality evidence uh, in pain relief and disability. Uh, also, uh, uh, myofascial release and fascial therapy has significant effect on reducing back disability, but not uh, helpful for improving lumbar range of motion, or uh, improving quality of life, but it can be considered uh, myofascial uh, release or fascial therapy, uh, maybe an effective adjunct therapy. Uh, all those uh, knowledge and then uh, scientific reports uh, takes us, we have to use uh, multimodal, multimodal programs uh, in the rehabilitation program of uh, chronic low back pain patients or low back pain patients. That's why uh, we have lots of uh, tools uh, as a physio uh, in our hands, uh, especially exercise is very strong tool. Uh, we, we have to take care of the patients, especially inspecting their uh, exercise program and giving some kind of recommendation during the exercise. And uh, as Kieran mentioned about be a mentoring, uh, be a mentor for uh, those patients during exercise. Thank you very much for your attention. We're going to move on and we're coming back to Brona. So, uh, Brona, you're going to talk to us about the resources which Ethic have 
Um, so I'll leave it up to you now. Thank you. So I would like to spend the next, uh, I suppose, 15 minutes uh, outlining resources that EFIC have to support clinicians and researchers in the field of pain science. But for today's presentation, obviously, I'll have more of a physiotherapy focus. So as I mentioned earlier, EFIC serves as the authoritative science-based resource on issues relating to pain and its treatment across Europe. Within the organization, physiotherapists are the second uh, largest group. And of course, we're always, I'll put a plug in here, we're always looking for volunteers to support uh, and disseminate our activities. And I'll have some uh, contact details at the end of the presentation uh, if you'd like to get involved more with, uh, with our work. So as Gay mentioned, I was the first female and the first chartered physiotherapist elected president of the European Pain Federation's uh, executive board. It's a six uh, panel board. Um, it is multidisciplinary now. Uh, I represent physiotherapist and Dr. Joanne O'Brien Kelly represents uh, nursing. And along with our medical colleagues, I suppose we, we, we drive uh, the organization along with our committees and executive office staff. So EFIC's activities, I suppose, map across three core pillars, uh, education, research, and advocacy. In education, we have developed curricula and offer examinations, uh, diploma examinations in um, across the different uh, disciplines. We run pain schools and we have e-learning platform. And I'll talk a little bit more in detail about these in a moment. In terms of research, we are active collaborators on research projects. We disseminate grants and prizes. And importantly, we, we develop guidelines and task forces uh, with expert colleagues on particularly relevant topics. And then most importantly, of course, not forgetting advocacy, raising awareness uh, on pain treatment and management plans and campaigning, of course, to improve policies uh, and research funding uh, for pain, which will all hopefully, uh, you know, um, improve patient care and reduce the impact of pain on patients' lives. So in terms of our education activities, education, I suppose, is one of the most established um, and um, largest uh, activity that we have. And our activities are both virtual and in-person. Our suite of in-person activities include fellowships, we run pain schools, We've developed a curricula. Uh, we offer refresher courses at our biennial EFIC Congress. And we also have the run the diploma examinations. And I'll, I'll outline those in a moment. And whilst it was always on EFIC's horizon to develop virtual education, I suppose, like a lot of things, the pandemic really accelerated our plans. So with all our in-person activities cancelled, we pivoted quickly into the digital space uh, and formed the EFIC Academy. So all our educational activities uh, at EFIC map to our core curricula. And these have been developed for pain physiotherapy, pain medicine, pain nursing, and pain psychology. And the purpose of the curricula, I suppose, is to articulate the scope of practice required by healthcare professionals that's necessary for effective quality patient care. The curricula outline the breadth and the depth of knowledge, the range of skills and the professional behaviours required for effective pain management. I suppose it also provides consistency of standards and outcomes uh, you know, across different countries in Europe through the establishment of a benchmark of standard competencies. The curricula are updated every five years in line with best educational practice. And the second edition of the core curriculum for the European Diploma in Pain Physiotherapy was published in September 2023. Uh, I'm very grateful to my physiotherapy colleagues on the EFIC uh, Physiotherapy Working Group led by Professor Harriet Whitting, and also again with, to um, Europe Region World Physiotherapy who collaborated uh, on the development of uh, this updated curriculum. So the curriculum has four uh, sections, pain science, pain assessment, pain management, and pain in specific populations. EFIC has also developed an undergraduate curriculum, 
in for physiotherapy. And the genesis of this came from an Erasmus grant that I was awarded and again worked with closely with Professor Heinrich Rittink uh, and other European colleagues, the Upscale Project. So the undergraduate curriculum was published in 2023 and was endorsed by the European Network of Physiotherapists in Higher Education or ENFI. We now have established a working group within ENFI for physiotherapists teaching pain and pain science and management to physiotherapy students. And through this working group, we hope to disseminate or we are disseminating and hopefully embedding this curriculum across physiotherapy programs in Europe. So the curriculum can be for self-development and, and learning, but it can also be used, uh, physiotherapists can also use it to, uh, to test their knowledge uh, by sitting the EFIC Diploma in Pain Physiotherapy. So this is a three-part examination. Uh, part one is held in the spring, it's held online, and it's a multiple choice uh, examination. Parts two and three are held in person in, in Leuven in the autumn of each year. This includes a practical exam and a VIVA examination where there's a discussion around a submitted a case study. So far, 30 physiotherapists have been awarded a, the diploma in pain physiotherapy. So if this is something you're interested in, um, uh, lots of information is available on the EFIC website. So in terms of our ed online educational activities, I suppose our flagship educational program is the EFIC Academy. And this brings together everyone who wishes to advance their competencies in the Federation's comprehensive multi-professional education program. So I suppose the flagship initiative uh, in the Academy is our, um, a, in, sorry, I should say individual membership of the Academy allows you access to our educational projects. Um, for example, the summit, our educational platform, reduce fees if you want to sit the diploma examination, free access to uh, EFIC's pain journal, the European Journal of Pain, and of course, access uh, to webinars. So this is an individual membership. However, EFIC does welcome collaborating with universities uh, and hospitals, you know, where a group rate is also available. So again, if you're interested, please contact us at EFIC. So the jewel and the crown of the Academy is our education platform. Platform was developed in consultation with medical education specialists to ensure, I suppose, effective and appropriate pedagogy. Again, it's developed around the four curricula. This is just a screenshot of uh, the platform. So if you're looking uh, for information around low back pain management, you can search under the physiotherapy curriculum, but it will also bring up um, how low back pain is assessed and managed from a medical perspective and uh, for psychological perspective in particular. So as well as discipline specific learning, you have an opportunity uh, to expand your knowledge on how other uh, healthcare professionals manage uh, such a, what can be a complex and disabling problem. So again, this is just a screenshot and um, doing a bit of a deep dive into the platform. So this on the right hand side, you can see we have the table of contents. So this summarizes um, uh, the EPIC curriculum. And then under each topic, each subsection has um, a small, has three or four um, brief educational sessions uh, that are uh, recorded. So, for example, I've just highlighted here, Professor Chris Main uh, recorded. Uh, I it, we had a, I had a conversation with him, which we recorded on how to make psychology more appropriate uh, to the patient and the public. So, of course, this is something is terribly relevant uh, for managing uh, back pain. In the years where we don't offer an EFIC Congress, we hold a two-day virtual pain education uh, summit. Again, there's over 30 hours of teaching across the two days and all content that we build or that we um, produce for the summit is then embedded into the education platform. So we're constantly updating uh, the, uh, the sessions that we have on the curriculum to make sure that the full curriculum is populated. So of course, at each conference, you know, back pain is, is a common topic 
uh, as part of the education summit. There are, again, discipline-specific sessions as part of the summit, but we also then, importantly, have interprofessional uh, sessions, uh, and it's live and the audience can interact with the speakers. In-person education activities, EFIC has developed and run a number of pain schools. These usually run on a biannual biannual basis. So we have cancer pain schools, we have a translational uh, pain school, we had um, we had a musculoskeletal pain school in Denmark in 2023. In 2024, we have a translational research pain school that has happened. But I do draw your attention to uh, our new pain school, uh, Psychology for Non-Psychologists, that will be held in the beautiful city of Verona in Italy in November. With the uh, pain schools, these are interactive teaching courses taking place over from two to four days. And they're targeted at healthcare professionals interested, in, I suppose, in further developing their knowledge and expertise in a specific area in pain management. They're led by some of the most distinguished and talented educators uh, from across Europe. And we deliberately keep the pain schools small uh, so that the sessions can be interactive and engaging. For each pain school, EFRIC offers 15 scholarships to attend uh, the pain school, and these will be advertised through the, um, uh, the EFRIC uh, communication channels, our newsletter, on our social media campaigns, but also on, on the EFRIC website. So if you are interested uh, in applying for a scholarship, please do uh, contact us. Scholarships have been awarded for the pain school in Verona. However, there is an opportunity for a small number of um, multidisciplinary healthcare professionals uh, to pay to, to attend uh, the school. So if you are interested, please, um, again, uh, you'll find more details on the website. And in terms of re FX research pillar has a number of uh, key activities. Uh, during my term as president, I initiated the development of an EFIC research strategy, uh, and I've linked this with uh, in with uh, Luis Garcia Larea, who is uh, the current president. Uh, and we currently have uh, we finalised the strategy, and it's under review for publication in the European Journal of Pain. So, of course, back pain and um, research. You know, of course, we heard from uh, previous speakers. There's a lot of research that has already been done on back pain, but there's more that needs to be doing. And again, this is outlined in our research strategy paper. EFIC is an active partner on EFIC, on European level grants. Uh, we're collaborating on Horizon 2020 grants, on Erasmus Plus grants, um, and other grants such as Innovative uh, Medicines Initiative, uh, IMI. So if you're considering submitting a European uh, grant on back pain or any other pain related uh, topic, um, perhaps think of EFIC and we'd be delighted to talk to you more. Our EFIC pain scientist, Network. This is an internal register for researchers. So if you're undertaking research in, in back pain or any other related uh, topic, we can put you in contact with other researchers in similar who are interested in participating in research in similar fields, whether you're a senior or a junior researcher. Or if you're interested in getting involved in a, a research collaboration, we can also make internal links um, with other um, members of our community across Europe. EFIC provides grants, uh, uh, grants and prizes. So again, we um, uh, we have an EGG, EEG grant uh, with a Grunenthal. So again, if you're considering uh, conducting some research in back pain management, uh, consider applying for our grant. Again, all the information is on the website. So this is just an example of some of um, our key activities that are ongoing. EFIC convenes independent uh, experts from time to time to develop scientific position papers. So as you can see, uh, we have the, um, the uh, EFIC research strategy that will be hopefully be published shortly. We wrote an editorial uh, last year for the European Journal of Pain. 
but we have also published clinical recommendations on the use or more importantly, uh, not using uh, opioids for chronic non-cancer pain. And we've also won for uh, the use of opioids in specific uh, populations. Bart Morlion, uh, who is an anaesthetist from Belgium and who was president from 2017 to 2020 uh, at EFIC, created the idea of a president's campaign where each president could focus on a specific, particular topic for the three years of his term. Um, so I was delighted when Bart chose the topic of promoting physical activity to prevent and uh, manage uh, acute and chronic pain. And as Karen mentioned earlier, this uh, we collaborated with uh, the Europe region on this project. We developed a campaign uh, material. So we have um, infographics and we developed a uh, short videos for promoting physical activity for people living with pain, uh, for healthcare professionals, and also promoting to the general public the, um, the importance, I suppose, of being physically active. These, these uh, initiatives have been translated into 17 different languages. So again, um, please feel free to go on the website. They're free to download and we encourage you to disseminate them as widely as possible. Uh, we've heard already from the speakers today the importance of physical activity and exercise in the management of low back pain. We've also just published in the European Journal a position paper on uh, the importance of physical activity. Again, um, it's in the journal, but you can also find it on the EFIC website. The theme of my presidency was on focusing on health literacy. And as Kieran mentioned earlier, you know, promoting uh, key messages around pain is so important, you know, to debunk the myths and to promote, to build resilience in our patients. So, of course, if we want to do that, uh, people need to understand uh, what we're saying. So the plain talking uh, campaign, again, similar to the On The Move campaign, we promoted infographics uh, for strategies, <coughs> excuse me, strategies that healthcare professionals can use um, to improve their communication uh, techniques. We've developed um, an infographic again for patients and also one for the general public promoting the importance of clear communication. Again, we've developed videos. These have also been uh, translated into multiple languages and are freely available uh, to download. Also, which may be of uh, use for people with back pain attending um, either physiotherapists or a doctor or G GP or consultant with back pain. Um, we developed a patient journey booklet. And this booklet, I suppose, walks people through the steps of what will happen when they go in for a consultation. People may not be aware that they need uh, you know, to fill in questionnaires, helps them prepare for questions they may, may want to ask their healthcare professionals. So, you know, we, we believe it's a useful tool in promoting health literacy and ensuring that patients can understand the information that healthcare professionals are giving to them about their pain and, of course, about their low back pain. So that's just a whistle-stop tour of resources that um, EFIC uh, has to uh, offer physiotherapists and other, of course, other healthcare professionals. And just draw your attention to um, our, the EFIC Scientific Conference in Lyon in 2025. Uh, the theme of the conference is comorbidity of chronic pain and mental health disorders breaking the cycle. So again, physiotherapists are core members of the team here, and we all know the benefits of uh, and important of exercise and mental health. If you're interested in submitting a workshop, there is a late breaking workshop um, a call that is open until the 16th of October. And the uh, Scientific Programme Committee have highlighted a number of themes that they're interested in receiving workshops from. So arthritis related pain, um, you know, speaks very clearly to um, back pain. So again, if you're interested in putting together a workshop, there's more information available on the website. So I'll close there. And again, I'd just like to uh, thank uh, the European Region of World Physiotherapy for um, 
hosting this webinar uh, and on behalf of EPIC, I look forward to um, a long and fruitful partnership and I'm happy to answer any questions your audience may have. Thank you very much. We have uh, an old friend of yours, Kirana, who has helped us on many occasions. Pete Moore has come in with a few questions and I think you've answered them in the chat box, but maybe we could just run through them for anybody who didn't see them in the chat box. Um, Pete is interested, in, and I'll turn it around a little bit, and the question would be, are physiotherapy schools, including learning supported um, modules on self-management of back pain within the curricula? So I guess I, I um, typed in a response there in the chat, but and I'm, I let some others come in. My sense, uh, and it was a great question, Pete, is that there is a lot more talk about the importance of self-management in physio programs, at least. I, can, I can't speak to other disciplines. So there's lots more talk about the concept, the importance, and developing resources. However, and this is not blaming anyone, I think in reality, when it comes out to professional practice placements, people with persistent pain are well down the priority list. And so often there's long waiting lists and when they're seen, there's limited time, long waiting lists, and the opportunity to adequately support them through self-management is severely lacking. Um, and so I think that's where sometimes I think people with pain might be concerned that when we say self-management and we mean supported self-management, they might hear and experience abandonment in terms of, you're on your own there now, honey, off you go. Um, and so I think, um, so, but I leave other people come in on that. I think it's something we we still need a lot of work on. So I suppose we could ask Phyllis, um, uh, in, in, in your university uh, programs, Phyllis, um, is there self-management modules uh, around back pain for your students? Uh, actually, uh, we do have some courses for undergraduate and postgraduate students. It's not a kind of module, but it's a kind of courses included in the uh, rehabilitation of the low back pain patients. Uh, because, you know, self-management is the key factor of the rehabilitation because education is another uh, another uh, uh, job of us, another profession of us. So to be a good educator and mentor for the patients uh, uh, is uh, very important. That's why we are always uh, recommending these strategy for our patients in, in both uh, undergraduate or postgraduate courses of us. And then also they are seeing uh, uh, our strategy in our clinics, because we have uh, clinics in our uh, faculty, then uh, they, all of the students uh, of us, especially the internship uh, students, uh, can have an opportunity to, uh, uh, to see uh, the real patients, uh, especially during their treatment and our uh, behavior to our patients, because as a teacher, we are also doing clinical practice in our faculty. Uh, with our assistant, that's why they have, they may uh, have a, 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 you know impression uh, about our behavior to patients and also the uh, educating of our patients uh, in these clinics. Okay, that's great. That's great. Thanks very much. So, um, Kiran, we have Matilda from Denmark, who is very interested in your comments about coaching. And uh, she's interested in knowing about the definition of pain coaching and the pros and cons in it, of it for physiotherapists. Maybe, would you like to comment on that? Sure, I'll come in on this. And again, I know based on what we were just mentioning, Pete Moore is um, in the audience. He might be able to speak on this, but I would recommend people check out his pain toolkit website, which is especially around pain coaching. I guess, I'm not so much interested in the term coaching. It's something we do. Like, for example, we might describe it as something different in 10 years time or in the past, like Felice mentioned, mentoring, supporting, advocating. But I guess it is a little bit of a mindset change from the stereotype of people going to see manual therapists like ourselves, where it's coming, 
get fixed through some form of adjustment or treatment or, or machine to actually saying, well, some of those things will stay as part of the toolbox, but really what we want is to get them on top of that. And so whether it was around, um, again, consistent with the idea of supporting self-management, I don't know what we call it or almost how formal we want to make it. We might call it different things, but essentially to use an analogy piece and others describe putting the person in the driving seat. So we might help them at the start, give them some hints, some nudges, some tips, but as much as possible, they take over the journey and, and take over the the, um, the control of that. And in that, I suppose that's where I'm coming from with that coaching mindset and those trials that Esther Mary talked about at the start, the Restore trial um, led by Peter Kent and Mark Hancock, and then Mark Hancock's more recent trial looking at walking, they did involve things that would be very much like traditional physiotherapy, clinical assessments, exercise, but there was also behavior change. And I know there's other questions related to it. It wasn't a short, intense burst of treatment. So for example, most coaching interventions talk about seeing people a little bit, but for a period of time to allow behavior change bed in. So what we're talking about here doesn't fit in with seeing people three times a week for three or four weeks, but more starting, tweaking, adjusting, figuring things out. And again, I'm sure others will have some thoughts. I would agree uh, exactly, Karen. And I think now it's all about, you know, there are so many, you know, chronic diseases, you know, that it's, it's not just for back pain. We're teaching this approach, you know, with cardiac disease, pulmonary rehab, you know, so it is something that um, we are embedding. It is embedded, you know, it is embedded in our curricula you know, because we're seeing it not only in musculoskeletal therapy, but this idea of, of supportive self-management must go across all the, you know, the neurological and the, the cardiovascular um, diseases that we, that we assess and manage. Would you like to come in there, Esther Mary? I see you nodding your head furiously. You're Thank you. Yes, I, I mean, just to really endorse uh, both what, what, what Kieran and, and, and Brona have said, it's that idea about, I suppose, supporting not only through the management, but through the change behaviour process and just, you know, empowering people to to manage and be in the driving seat. And it, it, it goes across all of the work that we do. It's not restricted to low back pain. So it's it's almost a, it's a, a module in itself in terms of of how we deal with all our patients in those who need to manage their own condition. Thank you, yes. Very excellent. Okay, so moving on. Um, now, this is something that I think comes up a little bit and it's probably just about language. Um, so the question is about manipulation. And because there's the, if there's the least evidence for manipulation, um, it falls into that category. Uh, I think it was Felix mentioned manipulation as part of the therapy or the manual therapy program. Okay, so maybe Felix, um, if you like to differentiate between maybe manual therapy and manipulation, or where you see that line, please. Uh, actually, many of the systematic reviews and meta analyses, especially the recent ones, state that both uh, manipulation and mobilization. Uh, have the uh, uh, moderate level uh, evidence. Uh, actually, some doctors may prefer to manipulation, especially having quick response uh, in the first term. Uh, that's why uh, the, 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 the participants uh, may asking why the doctors are preferring manipulation instead of uh, using mobilization. Uh, this uh, manipulation or mobilization program or other kinds of fascial therapy or neural therapy, uh, 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 neuromobilization therapy uh, can be designed dependent upon the patient situation uh, and also the characteristic of the pain. I mean, uh, uh, nociceptive pain, neuropathic pain, or the uh, sometimes the, uh, it can be designed dependent upon the a physiological response of the patients. Uh, that's why uh, many of the times uh, I prefer to change my uh, uh, manual therapy programming dependent upon the response. Uh, and then also the situation of the uh, pathology, uh, because sometimes uh, there, there wouldn't be just only one pathology. 
e, e, bulging disk or mechanical problems uh, associated other uh, uh, muscle weakness. That's why uh, the, the uh, uh, one cases could include different types of uh, problems. Dependent upon all those uh, situation, we can uh, have some choices, and these choices should not be uh, keep on all the ten session or uh, many sessions. Maybe change in every session dependent upon the patient's response. But I know because of the chiropractic practice, especially the chiropractor doctors prefer to use manual therapy because. Uh, quick response and also uh, very uh, quick time. Uh, the other techniques uh, may need it more time. That's why some doctor prefer to have ma manipulation instead of uh, other kinds of manual therapy techniques. Thank you, Phyllis. And I, our next question really rose into some of that. And Kieran, it's for you. It's regarding uropathic and nociceptive pain. And the question is should we exclude manual therapy for patients with chronic low back pain? No, no, not at all. Actually, uh, recently uh, we can talk about uh, also nociplastic pain in patients with low back pain. Actually, first it's termed for the patients who is suffering from uh, fibro uh, fibrositis or, or uh, uh, other kinds of uh, muscle pain. But uh, nowadays, we can also mention it about the nose plastic pain. Yes, there is a plasticity uh, in, 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 in cortical level in, in these patients in the chronic stage. But as far as I know, my clinics and also the, uh, from the study results in the literature, manual therapy also gives some kinds of facilitation for the uh, neural pathways. So that's why uh, I, I use also uh, chronic uh, low back pain patients. Uh, I use manual therapy for chronic uh, low back patients and also the study results I mentioned about uh, you, uh, uh, should be used or can be used to manual therapy for uh, chronic low back pain patients. Thank you, Phyllis. Um, and I think, Kieran, I've heard you mention you you have sort of uh, an approach to that as well uh, for chronic low back pain. Where, where do you sit on that? Yeah, sure. So I suppose to preface my remarks on this, it's funny when you look at all the guidelines across the different countries from different professions, most of the things they recommend are very clear cut. They will all pretty much say don't rush for imaging, opioids, surgery, don't promote bed rest and maybe do focus on, like from our point of view, education, exercise. And then there's this small pool of interventions that sometimes depending on the professional bias of people or how maybe they interpret the evidence can be recommended in one guideline and not in another. And that's where manual therapy slash manipulation fits that it is recommended in some guidelines and not others. And in terms of the broad evidence, and of course every patient isn't the same, there's evidence that it can on average be of benefit. The caveat often being that we're not sure how much for how long, because at the end of the day, if we're going to self-manage, they don't hopefully over time need too much physio intervention. So from my perspective, I would see that there's still, if I divide it artificially into assessment and treatment, there is still huge value in the touch element of interacting with a patient and the validity of examining somebody's person. Now, when you look at the evidence of what people want and value in an examination, they want to be examined, and this is the word they use, properly. Now, what that actually looks like, I don't know, but my instinct is that means the person looked at me, spent some time at me, did some tests, which we might think aren't that valid, but I think there's a strong role in the manual therapy assessment of that. I, I know for myself, I think I've handled that poorly in the past then where I thought I felt something and said some scary things that might have added to the person's disability. But I'd be strongly in favor of assessing the person in a way that is fitting, you know, is in line with their expectations. On the treatment part of how much of that treatment on an ongoing basis should be manual therapy, I personally think it probably should be a lot less than I have traditionally practiced and then maybe we have. But if in the short term you have a patient who has benefited from this before and who you can use this as a way to get them on board, I don't have a black and white position on it. 
So that's there's definitely an element of fence sitting there. Thanks very much, Kieran. Brona, yeah, I was just thinking there, Brona. Yeah, no, I would, I would uh, agree, Kieran. And I'm just thinking of the Lancet series of papers that came out uh, a few years ago, where they, um, I agree with you, different guidelines say different things, but they brought together uh, a number of guidelines and looked at, at commonalities. Uh, and I agree with you know with with um, uh, both you and 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 Phyllis, where it's it can be used. As an, I thought it was a, they call it you know a second a second strand adjunct, which I think is a you know a, they have things that are first strand so obviously exercise, uh, education, self management, and then it's it's you know time limited adjunct. So uh, I don't think you're sitting on the fence. I think you know that that's what the uh, the guidelines are saying. Lovely, thank you very much. Um, now. Uh, Pete Moore is asking us about meaningful movement rather than exercise. Now, Bruno, I was going to ask you that. Uh, do physiotherapists around the EU use this as a term, do you think, or, or not? Maybe, Alexa, I, I, have, uh, I have heard the term. I'm not sure how, I, I don't know how common it, how common it is. Uh, I think with anything, uh, with any, you know, exercise, physical activity, um, I think it's what, again, come back to what Kieran said, what's meaningful for the patient, you know, so uh, what is the patient likely to do? Is it exercise or is it physical activity? Is it gardening? Is it, you know, it, it can be walking, running, swimming, but it might be gardening. It might be um, uh, lower levels of, of physical activity, but that, you know, that may have more social aspect to it uh, that are important, you know, for engaging the patient. Uh, so, I am um, yeah. I'm I'm not particularly. For, um, I don't know how widespread it is, but I think it's it's all around. Um, like for all of us, doing a physical activity or an exercise we yeah. enjoy. Yeah, great. Uh, thank you very much. And Bruna, um, a question came in there. I think from the Africa region, um, about support from for me, support for membership for students from Africa. Do does ethics include Africa or not? The, 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 uh, the uh, EFIC Academy is open to anybody. Okay. Anyone uh, can have access to it. Uh, there is a sliding scale for the different professions and the, the lowest rate uh, for a, a student rate is, is 35 euro per year. Okay, great, great, great. Thank you. And um, Pete has come in again and um, I suppose this is a management strategy question, really. I don't think it's so much um, veered towards ourselves, but we, we can always uh, feed into it. And it's a, regarding the time given to appointments. OK, uh, I, and I think he's relating to the NHS, um, that the appointment times are short. And sometimes the treatments that we're giving, especially if we're coaching patients or going through things gradually with them that that requires longer time to do that but the the long-term outcome is important and can be better so how can we influence um, the times given to appointments and try to make them longer does anybody have any bright ideas on that uh, you influencers Maybe yes to Mary, you, you've been all around Europe. <laughs> Have you seen anything that, that works? Um, I, I'm, uh, I, I don't think I can be included in the category of influencers. Uh, <laughs> and I, I really should leave these to the, to the, to the experts, but um, I, I do have a real um, uh, strong belief in the importance of that very first appointment with our with our patients and and really listening um and as Kieran often says indeed you know listening to their story and what has um what the impact of their pain is having for them and how we work it out and I think you know if we actually reduce treatment times in the succeeding treatment times and actually put the effort into the assessment 
um, putting that patient in the, the driving seat, guiding them through it and actually having a longer supporting time when they are self-management, managing in the knowledge that they can come back if they need a little tweaking of their program or a little support um, because of perhaps, a, you know, the pain is, has been grand, but there's been a little kind of return of it. Um, so I think that we need to actually... Um, convince healthcare providers um, and you know it may be the physiotherapist manager or it may be a bigger part in the in the hospital or in the clinic to allow that reorientation of the the time allocation that we give uh, to our patients to facilitate a, a better outcome um, Thank you for uh, for letting me join that one. Yeah, if I could just add on to that, I would 100% agree. I guess it's when I do some workshops with clinicians talking about maybe some of these approaches, the single most common complaint, and it's a perfectly legitimate complaint, is what I'm proposing would involve spending more time and their system and structure doesn't support it. And I, I so I can empathize with that. And obviously systems we're talking about here will vary public, private, and between countries. But I do think if we look at, we'll say, promising interventions which have been tested in one inter in country or setting and that maybe haven't worked in another setting, it's often not about the individual clinician doing something wrong, but their system and structure not supporting it. So taking something from a public healthcare system to a private healthcare system is often challenged because the funding models are different. And so... I think it's almost like one of those things that you have to look at the healthcare system as a whole. I would argue in some of the systems, I would maybe, for example, look at the United States healthcare system and all its complexities where you are probably rewarded for being very busy and doing lots of stuff as opposed to the outcomes of the patients and, and, and a whole series of other things. So I don't think anybody's got to figure it out. I know Gay and I live in a similar part of the world and there's these challenges around time and waiting lists that exist but we probably just need to go back to Brona's point about looking at the commonalities in chronic conditions. We've got familiar with the idea that COPD and falls prevention and diabetes require time and interaction over a period of time, but that only works if your KPI is not clearing a waiting list or discharging someone off the waiting list. Lovely, thank you very much. Now, Phyllis, I see your hand is up there. Did you want to come in there? Yeah, actually, uh, uh, national health systems and insurance companies do not want to pay uh, for it for longer uh, peer, uh, longer duration of the physical therapy session. But uh, we can raise uh, some kind of suggestion to our uh, system. For example, uh, giving the five session or four session uh, uh, once in a week uh, with, with a sh shorter period we can give longer periods once in a week or every two weeks. Uh, that's why, because to be involved in patients, these patients for a longer period uh, in, in the, the same session it, it is much more valuable than uh, having a frequent uh, uh, session with a shorter period uh, during one week. That's why uh, I, I follow my patients uh, once in a week, but uh, but longer period, maybe can be much more helpful for the national system or insurance companies. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we've come to the end of all our questions and we've been given our answers. Um, so I think we are coming to the end of our webinar this morning. So I'd like to thank all our speakers very, very much uh, for, for preparing their presentations and delivering them so nicely and well. They will be very interesting and very stimulating. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Miguel and the European Region for, for, uh, for organising this webinar uh, and it's very useful for everybody. And finally, I'd like to wish you all a very happy World Physiotherapy Day and thank you for your attendance.